Hello. It's just me tonight. I thought I would take this time to talk about um, my experience uh, being fired or basically forced to resign from my job um, because I had a same-sex fiancé. So a little background. I am a musician, uh, have been for my whole life basically. Um, started playing piano when I was four. Um, my parents, uh, my whole family was raised Catholic, very Catholic. Um, my dad was a deacon growing up and I was an altar server from the time I was able to be until the time I left for college. Um, and uh, growing up a musician and in the church, it just was um, logical and it was my kind of dream job passion that I become a church musician. Um, and so I did, I studied piano from the age from age four until college I went to college for it um, I double majored in piano and organ performance um, I started studying the organ in high school when I started studying organ in uh, college I had played some at my home parish which was uh, St. Pius X in Conyers Georgia you know, I, I played like Saturday evening mass or whatever um, and the pastor paid me like I don't know, $25, which was just enough for me to take organ lessons from the organist there. And then when I got into college, I actually started an organist position at Carrollton Presbyterian Church. And then I had some scheduling conflicts with a class that I had to take, and so I became the organist at Mount Zion uh, United Methodist Church in Hapeville, Georgia. Right about when I was finishing college, a job opened up at Good Shepherd Catholic Church, which was in Cumming, Georgia. It was a long way away. It was an hour away, but I was like, oh, finally, a Catholic church that I can do what I do in. And um, I got the job, and it was a full-time music director position, and it, uh, and it paid much more than what I had been paying, so I was like, this is perfect. Um, and I was there for a little while, and it was great. Um, that was really when I was, I think I would say in my, I hit my stride as far as like, I was doing what I loved, I was doing what I really wanted to do. It was around that time when I came out, I had been, I had been married to a woman. I came out to her, my family and everyone, uh, which was, um, that's a whole other story. That's a whole other video. Of course, obviously, you know, I didn't, none, none of that was, I was keeping that away from my job, basically, which was easy because it was an hour away and, you know, those were two very separate things. And after a while, I, uh, I had a boyfriend who, um, you all know now is Sammy, although they never come on camera, but they are part of our polycule still. So we got engaged at that time. This was, you know, this was before marriage equality was realized. Um, so, you know, I was posting about it a lot on Facebook. Some people at that church, some parishioners had found some of my posts on Facebook about marriage equality and whatnot and printed it out and gave it to um, the pastor at Good Shepherd and so we talked about it. He didn't care. He said, like, you know, whatever, I, I don't, I don't care. And I just, that was, it was really quick. It was, there was nothing to it. He, you know, it was not really a discussion. So I didn't really worry about it. I just kept doing my job. So yeah, I started at Good Shepherd in 2009. Um, in 2012, I saw a a job listing for um, St. Bridget Catholic Church in Johns Creek, Alpharetta, Georgia area, which um, 
I had been to before. My grandparents had a uh, like a they have like an anniversary mass or something like that every year, and so I had gone there because my grandparents were part of that, and so and I you know I always knew that that church was one of the largest in the Archdiocese of Atlanta. It had a beautiful pipe organ. Um, it was a beautiful building. Um, and so when that job listing uh, came up, I thought I would I thought I would take a chance at it. It seemed like a good opportunity and it was it was closer to where I lived. Um, which was nice because after driving an hour to work all the time, any anything that's closer it seems very attractive. So I filled out an application, or I sent them my resume and whatnot, and got an interview. And the pastor at St. Bridget at the time was Monsignor David Talley. I could tell he was a deeply, like, wise man, like, very thoughtful, very genuine. Like, we seemed to really, like, have a good connection right away. And so they offered me the job, and I took it. Um, it was a little bit of a pay raise as well, which was nice. Everyone at Good Shepherd was sad, but they understood. So, yeah, I started St. Bridget in September of 2012. At Good Shepherd, I was the music director in charge of everything, played the organ. At St. Bridget, the thing that attracted me about that position also was um, that I was to be the organist, but there was already a music director. So that spread out some of the work, you know, so I didn't have to do all this planning. I was really going to be able to concentrate on my playing, which I had really wanted to do, um, especially on a nice instrument. They've got a Casavant there. And so it was exciting. I was very excited. So I was the assistant um, director of music there and organist. So I helped. Um, the music director there was Meredith Kane. She led the choirs. Um, we co-led the children's choir. And I was also the music teacher for their day school there. Um, it's like a preschool um, program. And so I taught music classes during the day to, um, to the preschool students. It was great. It worked out for a while. Our, uh, the pastor, David Talley, um, he would always sneak into the sanctuary while I was practicing and listen to me play. And I don't know, we just had a great relationship. It was a very large church. It was about 5,000 families registered, so very large. I think St. Bridget was maybe 2,600 families registered. So that's also large, but St. Bridget was just on a different scale. I think, I guess it was probably just a few months after I started at St. Bridget, Monsignor Talley brought me into the office to, for a meeting because, and it was a very similar meeting. He had, um, I think, I guess printouts or whatever that someone had brought to him from my Facebook about me supporting marriage equality. And I remember he was very understanding about it. He told me a story about how his, one of his best friends that he grew up with came out to him when they were much younger, it came out to them as gay, and um, and he still loved him. He understood. He he just made me feel very comfortable about the fact that he found out. And he he said, "You can tell whoever you want to tell. It doesn't matter to me." We basically kind of came to the agreement that because um, I didn't even really like think about the fact that my Facebook profile was public, and I didn't really use it a whole lot um, before that, and the whole privacy thing was like just kind of like I didn't really think about it so we were like oh yeah I'll, I'll just make it private it'll be fine and he was like yeah that's fine cool and we never spoke about it again things went on as normal when the end of 2012 came we found out that the Pope elevated Monsignor Talley to become one of the auxiliary bishops of Atlanta and that was going to happen the following year and um, of course everyone at St. Bridget was very excited sad to learn that he was gonna be leaving us but like it's exciting I guess when you know someone is elevated to bishop especially when it's your own pastor 
in the months leading up to that, I think that was May of 2013 is when he got ordained, which I went to. I went to his ordination, or what, I guess, was it an ordination? Whatever. But leading up to that, Meredith Kane, the music director, was pregnant um, and was planning on stepping down so that she could have that time off. So the plan was that when once she stepped down that I would become the director of music, which was cool. I was like, okay, yeah, that's cool. And it was going to be another raise. I was like, yeah, this is cool. And I have experience being the director of music and organist, so I was excited about that. Then we were talking about the possibility of hiring an assistant organist for me, like having someone like me for me when, like, now that if once I become the director of music. Um, and I was like, yeah, that could be cool. Um, I was hesitant because, like, I love playing. That's, like, a big part of what I love about doing all that. So I was going to set it up to have, like, an assistant organist, but I would, like, still play hymns and whatnot. Uh, you know, I would still be playing a little bit. But I was open to the idea of having an, an assistant organist. We started looking. Uh, we start, We posted job ads. And we heard a few organists. And I did not like any of them. Yeah, all of the organists that we heard were just not inspiring at all. There was this one lady in particular that Meredith called um, to interview for the position and I don't remember her name right now she was from like a nearby parish not far away and she came in and it was just like I said it was just not inspiring playing um and I know I'm not like I'm not the best organist in town but I, I at least like to I try to breathe life into my playing and to him playing, and um, so it's, it was very important to me to have an organist that like had shared that kind of playing, and so I did not want to hire her, but Meredith was like telling me, oh well, you know she's she is much better when she's not nervous or like when she warms up or like when she's not in the interview scenario or whatnot, and she basically talked me into hiring her. And um, finally, I was just like, okay, yeah, sure, why not? And so that was in the works. Um, we were going to hire her as my assistant. And so then May comes, I guess. I don't remember the exact date of the ordination. The weekend, the weekend after that, when Bishop Talley was gone, our parochial vicar throughout all this time was Father Joshua Allen. He was like a, he's like an assistant priest at a church you know they, they have a lot of churches have multiple priests um and so they you know they they can take care of various masses they don't so that you know not one priest has to do everything um so he was he became the temporary administrator he was in charge for the interim until they found a new pastor so as soon as he was the temporary administrator I got a call on Monday, May 6th of 2013, saying that I was going to be put under suspension, um, pending termination, I think was the, the, the wording of the letter. Um, and the reason given was that my Facebook profile stood in moral dissension with the teachings of the Catholic Church. The very next day, they had me come in and pick up my belongings. I, you know, I had a bunch of books and my organ shoes, um, my teaching materials, whatnot. I think I even had some instruments there, my flute and whatnot. And um, I remember when I went in that day, there was this man that worked in the office. He was like head of the property or whatever, Marin. Marin? Um, and uh, he followed me around as I was picking up all my things, like, and taking my keys from me. It was, like, pretty humiliating. He was, he was just, like, I don't know, very cold, and everyone was just kind of, like, staring, and it was not cool. 
to be, you know, treated like that. And so I got my stuff and left. That was the last time I ever stepped foot in that building. Um, the next night, Wednesday night, which is choir rehearsal night, I got a call. I, you know, I, I stayed home. I didn't go to choir rehearsal because I was under suspension. I had called the HR department on Tuesday after after I got my stuff, before or after, I don't remember. So the, the HR department at the Archdiocese of Atlanta, because the Archdiocese of Atlanta oversees you know, like all the churches in Atlanta. And so I called their HR de- office and I was like asking like, hey, what is going on? Like, they just, they, they placed me under suspension. Is it like, am I going to be paid during this time? Do you know what's going to happen? And they didn't even seem to know what was going on. They didn't know anything. They were like, oh, let, we'll look into it and we'll call you back. Um, and so Wednesday came, choir rehearsal happened, and I got a call from one of the staff singers who was friend. you know, we were friends. And she said... Um, that during choir rehearsal, Meredith announced that they were looking for my replacement. So I was <laughs> shocking because, you know, I don't know, they for them to already be announcing that to choir. Um, so I called the HR office again, and um, they were like, what? They can't do that. What? We'll, we'll get to the bottom of this. We'll call you back. They would never call me. I was always calling the HR office. Finally, like on, on May 9th, on that Thursday after that, um, the HR office said that the suspension period would be paid. So that was at least some kind of news. And then I didn't hear anything from them after that until um, Father Joshua Allen called me in for a meeting on uh, May 18th. So that was, you know, a several days after of just radio silence. During this time, I was also trying to get in touch with Bishop Tally, because, you know, he had always had my back, and I was trying to, like, get in touch with him to, like, talk about what was going on, see if he could help me out. Um, And he always said, or his secretary or whatever would always say that he'll get back to me, and he never did. Still hasn't to this day. Um despite several attempts to contact him. I got called in for a meeting May 18th with Father Josh Allen and Marin, that guy, and he said that I would, I was indeed being terminated. He said that the HR department at the Archdiocese wanted them to terminate me with no pay or whatever, and that he was the one that fought for me to, like, be able to offer resignation with severance. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, I was under the impression that I wouldn't get unemployment if I was fired or whatever, and so I opted to resign, and so that they would give me some severance, because I need, you know, we needed money to be able to survive for the next however long until I could find a new job. So, I resigned. I'm sorry, that meeting with Father Josh where I resigned was May 15th, not the 18th. I never heard from Bishop Talley. Father Joshua Allen I already knew to be very conservative. I could tell that with his homilies. But he also has lots of videos of him online talking about um, homosexuality and stuff. For me to say that that was a big deal for me, I don't know how to even put that because if any of you have grown up Catholic or are Catholic, you know how much your life revolves around it. When my family, extended family, would come into town, when we would gather, one of the first things that we did as a family was pray the rosary. When we were, when my family went on vacation, we were, they would like seek out what, where the Catholic churches were around the area so we could go to Mass. It was just like part of who we were and and this was like them kicking me out you know like I wasn't allowed anymore they didn't want me to be playing the organ for them anymore um
I found out a few weeks later that when Bishop Tally left, that he went ahead and he, he was the one that gave the green light to Father Josh to do this to me. And I guess, you know, that may not be true, but I, I you know, he has never contacted me or apologized or said anything to me to, to help me believe otherwise, you know, for him to just not want to contact me. Well, when it was all happening, the sec his secretary said that he couldn't get in contact to contact with me while this was all going on, and that he would talk he would call me later, and he just never did. When this was going on, I was talking to the dean of the Atlanta chapter of the American Guild of Organists, just you know, just to talk and to see like what I could do, and there was no you know, of course there's no legal recourse there because they're a church and I was in a ministerial position and so there was nothing I could do. What the AGO did, the uh, American Guild of Organists, was we decided to reach out to St. Bridget to offer or to have a meeting with a mediator with their new, pa they had found a new pastor. This was I guess September of 2000. 13, Father Neil Harley, he, I don't know how to say his name. Um, so it would be with him and Father Josh Allen, who was still there. They said that Father Josh was out of town until August, and so that they would contact us then, and nothing ever came, nothing else ever came out of that. They never responded again. Even, I think we reached out again after August, and nothing, nothing happened. So then, the AGO... Um, who on their website lists employment positions. They put a disclaimer on their page that said, um, a complaint has been filed against St. Bridget Catholic Church for which no resolution or mediation has occurred. No AGO member may seek employment at this institution until the matter is resolved. No member may hold an interim or substitute position at this institution beyond 30 days of this notice, which was um, in August of 2013. It was something, it was what they could do, I guess. It made me feel a little better. But then that dean of the Atlanta chapter, shortly after that, um, his term was over, and so they got they had a new dean come in, and she took the warning down, and I was part of the board at the AGO at that time, and um, during that changeover, and she just, like, she was just no help. Um... And I just felt like they didn't care or they weren't willing to like stand up or say anything else so that their members could work there, which, you know, I guess they're protecting the jobs of their other members too. I never went back to the AGO after that. So that assistant organist that they had had me hire was convenient for them. It was, they did it on purpose so that they would have someone there when I left. I basically had me hire my replacement, basically. Since the Atlanta AGO had that disclaimer up on their website for a while, I heard that the um, the person that took my place, the new director of music, I think they got from South Carolina somewhere. So yeah, I know. I had thought that Meredith had my ba you know, was like in my corner during all that. I think, given the weird awkward nature of like her trying to talk me into hiring that organist I think like I think they had told her what was going on after soon after it happened I um I was feeling really burned and um composed of a long email explaining what happened that I sent to the staff and all the choir members just because, like, I didn't want any, like, weird rumors or anything to pop up or whatever. And Meredith's husband was on that list because, um, I can't remember if he sang in the choir or whatever, but, um, he replied to my email with, um, it just said unsubscribe, so <laughs> I was just like, wow, okay, I get it. 
I see. A few choir members emailed me back and uh, told me that they were really upset by what happened. I think one of them even left or confronted the priests about it, but nothing ever happened. Business was going on as usual. And I lost my income and I lost the church that I grew up in. Not that church in particular, but the Catholic church, which is what I grew up with. And it was very, very hard. It's something I have not yet fully recovered, I guess you could say, from. Um, not long after that happened, I found a, a, a position at a Presbyterian church in Atlanta, Rock Spring Presbyterian Church, who took me in. It was a massive pay cut, and it was only a part-time position. So my fiancé and I had to move out of our apartment into a uh, falling down house with some roommates and kind of uh, we struggled for a long time after that um, not just I mean financially yes but um, I just have never been the same since that happened my parents are still um, devout Catholics they always will be and they try very hard to get me to um, reconcile with the church. I don't really even know what that means. They've mentioned that they want me to play again for, uh, I guess, like the, the the position at their church, St. Pius and Conyers, had had uh, opened up a few times in this, you know, in the years after all this happened, and they always mention like, oh, you you should come play you should do you should apply for the position they didn't always understand that even if i wanted to do that the archdiocese of atlanta wouldn't have allowed me to work there because they control the hiring and the firing so that passion that i had for church music um took a very massive blow when that happened i still love playing the organ and I always will but like being in that environment or whatever it's it um, it's very hard still and um, I do wonder a lot what ha what would have happened if I stayed at Good Shepherd and then I realized that you know I imagine the same thing would have hap happened inevitably because they were in the Archdiocese of Atlanta also, and so it just it would have happened wherever I was at, I think. And, you know, people were blaming me for a while after it happened for being open about it on my Facebook profile. They're like, well, you shouldn't have put that stuff on Facebook. You know, you shouldn't have supported marriage equality on your Facebook and um, I think even, you know, that was even something my parents said to me was, um, you know, I don't have to be so open about it. And yeah, they're right. Like, I, if I had hit it, then this would have not happened. But there's a thing that happens when you come out because you've been hiding who you are for so long. In my case, I didn't come out until I was 25. <laughs> it really upsets me that I waited that long. It upsets my mom that I waited that long. She said over and over again, why did you wait? But I was brought up knowing that it was wrong.
when you're brought up knowing that it's a sin and you just you just hide it I did everything I could to bury it I even married a woman who I did love but it's just I wasn't being who I was and I, I'm just It's not worth thinking about, but it's really hard not to think about how things would have been if I had not waited so long. <laughs> you know, I've, I've realized that when you can be yourself, it does wonders for your self-confidence. Because I had none before I came out. People probably, you know, people would say that I acted like I did. People said that, oh, you were so happy, though. And I was. I was happy. But you don't really realize that you don't have anything else to compare it to um, when you're living like that. It's only after the fact that I've realized that um, being open about who I am and being myself it brings uh, a whole it's a whole different level of confidence and the confidence doesn't come right away it took it has taken me a long time but a lot of people have told me, because I, I still get upset about it. I still get upset about what happened to me, how they treated me. And a lot of people's advice is to move on and forgive them and whatnot. And I find myself not willing to do that. They have made no effort to get in touch with me to, like, talk to smooth things over, anything, and none of them lost any sleep over what they did. It damaged me, you know? It, like, really hurt. F for years, it still hurts sometimes, as you can tell. Um, and they don't care. They only want people working in their churches who reflect the teachings of the church. But it's such bullshit because everyone who works in the church is doing something in their life that's against the Catholic Church. Openly. It's not even like they hide it, you know? But homosexuality is something that they just will not... Uh, abide and I will never consider even for a second uh, going back to the Catholic Church while they think that what I'm doing is sinful that's just I, I have a very fundamental basic belief that it is not a sin to be gay and to be acting on it. Why would I want to be in a church that I wouldn't even be able to be married in? Like, so, I'm not at Rock Spring Presbyterian Church anymore, I, but I am at another Presbyterian church, uh, Oglethorpe Presbyterian Church in Brookhaven, Georgia. It's nice to 
for Rock Spring and this church. It's it's been nice having churches that I can still do what I am good at and have a place of like some healing um, to help me, you know, get past all this. I just I know it will be a long process. This is really hard. The reason I wanted to do this, though, was, like, I finally wanted to just kind of get it all out, and, um, because there were some, like, magazine interviews, uh, and even, like, a, an 11 Alive, like, news story about what happened afterwards, but they left so many things out that I just, I wanted to, like, talk about what happened. It's, it's been years and I still, it still bothers me sometimes because, like I said, it just, that is, that was my life, basically. That was my upbringing. And they just continue to say that I'm not welcome there. And, um, yes, there are Catholic priests who don't mind or, like, would hire me or, you know, whatever. Um, so I know, like, my parents' church, like, I think they've talked about how they would have, they would hire me, whatever. But the thing about that is, like, it doesn't really matter when there's a hierarchy in the power structure of the Catholic Church, and it doesn't matter what a priest thinks, if uh, if the archdiocese or whatever, or the Pope, doesn't agree with something, then it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll they could fire me anyway. And so I just like, why would I put myself through that again? I just don't see the point in that. I'm not sure if my passion for that for church music will ever be back to what it was. That's okay for me, I think. Some of you some of you may know that uh, I also play in a band in Atlanta named Brother Hawk, and they've been there for me this entire throughout this entire process. When it happened, we were a band before I even was hired at St. Bridget, and that world that we kind of revolve in as a rock band is filled with a lot of people who don't even like care about the church you know they don't believe or whatever and consistently they have been the most Christ-like people that I would be around it really says something to me you know when uh, when it's those two worlds you think you would think they seem like very opposite things in one way but for me um, a lot of times it's been reverse it's been the opposite the interesting thing is my parents have since joined a um, a group in Atlanta and I guess it's like a nationwide thing called fortunate families which is a um, a group for Catholic parents of LGBTQ children. It's like, I guess, like a support group. And my dad is like even the liaison to the Archdiocese, to the Archbishop of Atlanta for that, for the group here in Atlanta. They're always very eager to tell me about the conversations they have and the progress that they're making. And I, you know, I'm proud of them for coming that far and being able to openly be in that group and fighting that fight, or fighting it to the extent that they can. That's the thing about Catholicism. N no one really, it's, it's hard to fight for something like this because everyone knows that, oh, it, the Catholic Church, Church changes in centuries, you know, it, it's a very slow moving progress. So everyone already kind of like, before they even start fighting, they know that is it is it even worth the fight or 
they're not even going to see anything happen in their lifetime. I I appreciate that they are in those group in that group, but that fight is not for me anymore. Just recently, the um, there was a fortunate families group in the archdiocese of Detroit that was disbanded by the archdiocese for the same reason that I was forced out. So it's just it's not my fight anymore. Like. <laughs> I guess I'm still open to, I, I would be open to a conversation with uh, Bishop Talley and Father Josh Allen. I don't even think they're around anymore. I think Bishop Talley's in St. Louis or something. Father Josh went to Georgia Tech for a while and then I don't know where else, he, well, I don't know where he is now. But if they ever reached out to me and wanted to talk, I'd be willing to talk. But only if it were an apology. Something meaningful. Because I don't think they give a shit. I mean, okay, so... Yeah, that was really heavy and all that. But, I, you know... I have, for the, for the most part, moved on from all that. Um, I'm not... F like feeling like this all the time I don't want you to feel like I'm I'm living like this all the time uh, it does come up for me sometimes uh, like recently the SCOTUS decision about gay people in the workplace uh, and transgender people everyone was very excited about it and it is very exciting I guess but it just brought it it brought me back to this and the fact that it wouldn't have even it wouldn't have helped anyway so there's always things that kind of bring it back for me, and it comes back, and it's still painful. I guess that's just kind of what happens when, for the first two decades of your life, are uh, in service to the to your church family. It's gonna hurt a little bit, I guess. So yeah, I'm doing much better. Sammy and I are still married. I had a lot of people tell me that. Uh, gay relationships don't last very long when I came out and I met Luke or Sammy I don't know I don't even know what to say to that that's so stupid I am doing very well for the most part I mean yes this COVID-19 thing is like squirting with me but um the band uh, Brother Hawk is we're busy writing um, going to try to record an EP sometime this year and uh, I'm focused on that and my two spouses Jace and Sammy continue to prove to me that being true to yourself and open about who you are and loving yourself and loving others is always going to be the right thing to do and everything else that happened all that other mess is just just that it's just a mess and um, so yeah so thank you all for listening. If you made it this far, I appreciate it. My situation was not just an isolated event. It has happened to many, many other organists or teachers in the Catholic Church. I'm not the only one, and it continues to happen. So if you are someone that has gone through something like this, or you know someone, uh, or you're Catholic, or whatever... Um, or you struggle with your faith or whatnot, feel free to reach out to us uh, in the comments or whatever, or message if you need someone to talk to about it. But yeah, hope you all take care, and I'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.